This is Dermatology Weekly, the weekly podcast from MD Edge Dermatology. I'm MD Edge editor Elizabeth Mishkati. And I'm MD Edge editor Terry Rudd. This week, we're looking back at our interviews from the summer meeting of the American Academy of Dermatology in New York City. We'll start with Dr. Adam Friedman, who reviewed the topic of nanotechnology from a dermatology perspective. We'll follow that with Dr. Justin Koh, who explained how augmented intelligence can enhance the practice of dermatology. Dr. Andrew Alexis discusses topical treatment options for hyperpigmentation, and Dr. Henry Lim answers questions about data on sunscreens, including the potential environmental effects of sunscreen ingredients, as well as the FDA's sunscreen absorption study. And finally, Dr. Simal Desai provides an overview of topical and oral therapies for patients with pigmentary disorders. You can reach Dermatology Weekly by emailing us at podcasts at mdedge.com. You'll also find that email address in the podcast description. We'll be right back after this message. What is nanotechnology and what are its implications in dermatology? At the summer meeting of the American Academy of Dermatology in New York City, Dr. Adam Friedman addressed the topic in a presentation at the meeting and in an interview with MD Edge Dermatology. Dr. Friedman is a professor of dermatology and the interim chair of the dermatology department at George Washington University in Washington, DC. Nanotechnology is a very broad science uh, that can be distilled down into simply this. It is the investigation, the manipulation, the development of materials that have at least one dimension that ranges between one and 100 nanometers. And, and this is probably the most important element, uh, where unique phenomena emerge. Now, size is certainly important for many facets of medicine uh, with respect to diagnostics and therapeutics, but especially when you're considering dermatology in the skin, our target is often our hardest impediment to get over. Often our topicals have a very hard time getting to where they need to be, and, and nanotechnology, just by size alone, can really offer for um, some unique benefits, even separate from the unique properties that emerge at this very small billionth of a meter size range. So simply put, if you have a material that stays on the skin longer, is kind of embedded in the stratum corneum or within the undulations of that exterior, that increased resident transit time will enable whatever drug you may have in, in your particle or whatever formulation to diffuse through the skin and get to where it needs to go. Similarly, just based on size alone, the likelihood of that material getting through our armor, getting through the barrier, also increases as you decrease the size of a substance. Now, there are several ways things can get through the skin. Most common ones would be inter and intracellular pathways. Both are very difficult, though. And and so, as we would want, the skin is a great barrier to a lot of things on the outside, but including these drugs. So nanotechnology can offer a new way and a better way to get things through that barrier and to elements of the skin where they are sorely needed. Now, when you shrink something down to the nanoscale, you increase the surface area to volume ratio. And what that means is that there's more surface area to go around. That increases the reactivity of a substance because if you shrink something very, very small, but has a very broad surface area, its likelihood of interacting with its target, whatever that target may be, exponentially increases. The way to think about it is if you have a giant dart but a tiny bullseye, the likelihood of hitting that target is pretty low. Or if you flip that around, a tiny dart in a giant bullseye, as many bacterium, fungi, viruses, even you know cells are, are huge on the nanoscale, your likelihood of interacting with your target exponentially increases. Now, there are many areas in in dermatology from a medical problem preventative standpoint to a diagnostic standpoint to even a therapeutic standpoint. A lot of opportunities for nanotechnology. I'm only going to focus on a couple in the interest of time. But inflammatory diseases, lots of opportunity. If you think of disease states like psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, even collagen vascular disease, just taking what we already have, topical steroids, calcium neuron inhibitors, even small molecule inhibitors like PD-4 inhibitors, if you stabilize them, encapsulate them, improve their delivery through the skin, limiting also where they go in the skin and and really making them more targeted and personalized for that disease state, you really can better capitalize on these drugs. And that's already what's going on in multiple disease states. But when you think about nanotechnology, there are opportunities to 
attempt to deliver on deliverables, agents that really don't play nice with our current delivery technologies. These include ingredients like nitric oxide, uh, a gaseous molecule that is involved in almost every biological process but is extremely labile and very difficult to uh, translate to the bedside. We've done some research in the area of acne, in skin and tough tissue infections, wound healing as nitric oxide plays a role in, in all of these, uh, these processes. And in many, there is actually a deficiency of nitric oxide in the pathologic state. Ingredients such as curcumin, which is very lipophilic, bright yellow at the bulk scale. When you shrink it down to the nanoscale, you can make it almost invisible, uh, decreasing that cosmetic compliance issue when dealing with something unsightly. And more recently, looking at the world of medical cannabinoids, a whole host of bioactive substances, whether derived from the cannabis plant, synthetically derived, or, or even from our own bodies, our endocannabinoid system, these two are very difficult to deliver in our standard formulations because of their chemical composition. Nanotechnology can enable the penetration through the skin, but also stabilize them and get them to where they need to be. Now, I think in, in general, when we think of nanotechnology, one of our first thoughts is actually safety. And, and the reality is when you shrink something down to the nanoscale, if it's inherently dangerous at the macro scale, you're probably going to make it even more dangerous if you shrink it down and make it more reactive. But this shouldn't be a generalization to all nanotechnology. In fact, research has shown that we are exposed to nanoparticles on a daily basis from metals that spontaneously release silver, copper nanoparticles to even natural nanoparticles formed by you know, geysers, by oceans, and of course, unnatural ones formed by cars and, and other technologies. Um, so we've been exposed to nanoparticles for quite some time, so there has to be a very focused approach when thinking about safety. But I think the area that comes up most would be sunscreens. And sunscreens are a very hot area right now with respect to safety. Uh, the recent JAMA article showing some systemic absorption of certain chemical filters has raised awareness of these potential safety issues. And I highly potential because in that study, there was no correlation between systemic absorption and pathology. And I think it's very important to focus on that because I think there's a lot of misinformation about that data. That said, if you have someone or you yourself are not convinced and want to resort to a sunscreen that or a sunscreen ingredient that the FDA has deemed grace or generally regarded as safe, that's where we have our titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. At the bulk scale, not so nice looking, kind of kabuki makeup-esque, very thick, only can be solubilized in very lipophilic, oily vehicles. Uh, and that's where nanotechnology has really capitalized on those unique properties to make them less visible and easier to suspend in more pleasing vehicles. The concern is if these actually do penetrate the skin, if they get into cells, could they cause DNA damage, lipid damage? And all data to date shows that the formulations over the counter that utilize nano sunscreens do not penetrate the skin. They sit exactly where they are supposed to sit because they were designed to do so, and they do not cause the damage one would anticipate from the preclinical studies that are published here and there that raise a lot of these concerns. So nano sunscreens, from all we've seen most recently, a clinical paper in the journal Investigative Dermatology. They are safe, they are effective, and so in the era of, of the kind of questions of sunscreen safety, this is certainly a plausible route to maintain that sun protection because there is no question ultraviolet radiation causes skin cancer. Everything else is still up for debate. So to finish up, what's probably going to come out first? What's going to be new to the marketplace in the nano world? There have been some clinical studies published. There was one in 2016 looking at a liposomal cyclosporin for psoriasis. So fingers crossed we'll see that as part of our armament too. Coming to the over-counter space near you, my group is actually working on a topical nano-encapsulated lidocaine, we call Z-Pod lidocaine, that should hopefully be you know, hitting the shelves in, in a matter of months based on our preclinical studies and, and the evidence to date showing both increased efficacy as compared to standard formulations of lidocaine, but also a standardized safety that one would hope from a, a topical anesthetic. And now, an interview with Dr. Justin Koh of the Department of Dermatology at Stanford University. Dr. Koh spoke during the plenary session of the summer AAD meeting on the topic of augmented intelligence and dermatology. He discusses the topic further with MD Edge reporter Ted Bosworth. Dr. Koh is the co-author of AAD's position statement on augmented intelligence, issued earlier this year. So, uh, Dr. Koh, let's just start by saying, what, you know, what is uh, augmented intelligence? 
Yeah, I, th- I think augmented intelligence is a term that's specifically used so that we can move people away from conceptions about artificial intelligence. I think when we use that term, the first thing that pops into people's minds are robots, terminators, you know, other things that seem intimidating and scary. And I think that misconception is one that I really want to draw attention towards. So artificial intelligence in in our current conception in in our modern world, these are essentially technologies that allow us to train something to do a very specific task, a very narrow focus. It's something that requires human intervention, requires human intelligence. And what it really means then is that we can use those artificially intelligent tools to help us do what we do as humans better in a way that enables, uh, for example, in medicine, the delivery of care. And so when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's purposefully flipping the script. And it's saying that actually people shouldn't be scared of artificial intelligence. In fact, what we should do is we should embrace those things that it can do that we don't do well. And we can use it to augment, to increase our capabilities, to make us be able to take care of patients in a way that without that um, we're unable to do. So it really is in that synergy between the technology and humans that each is doing what it does best. And in doing that, we bring something to the patient that they wouldn't have had without either. You mentioned this morning when you spoke here at the summer AAD meeting that there was some concern that the ability of artificial intelligence to recognize skin cancers or other dermatologic lesions could put dermatologists out of the job. You reassured them about that and said that there was a lot of other applications that could really make their lives easier. Can you Tell me about those. Yeah, I think one of the the real benefits when I look back at some of that research that we did initially that got a lot of press, uh, one, it opened people's eyes as to the potential of artificial intelligence and being able to improve, potentially improve care. But I think what it also did was in people's minds, it associated artificial intelligence and dermatology with that. And I actually think that when we think about what's going to happen and what are the things that are on the horizon in terms of how AI and augmented intelligence can help us and help our field, it's not necessarily going to be those point of care diagnostics. What it's going to be initially uh, are going to be those workflow enhancements, those things that we currently do and we rely on people to do and And we know that we could do better. So, for example, what should my schedule template look like based on what kinds of patients I want to see, how long I typically spend with them, um, what my no-show rate is likely to be? Um, All of those things with the advent of EHR and all this data that we have, we could utilize those to build in AI workflow tools that could really make our mundane tasks easy. You know, beyond that, we start to think about a little bit um, further further down the, the road. It's not so far that uh, we could be interacting with a patient and an AI virtual assistant could be taking note of those conversations, the discussions that we're having and generating a documentation, a note, and generating a summary for the patient um, and generating all of that paperwork and, and doing all of those things in support of the note that we do right now just because no one else is doing it. But we don't have to. It's not, it's not um, something that utilizes our expertise. It's not something that utilizes our time or our skill set. And uh, to be perfectly honest, when that happens is it makes us feel demoralized. It makes us feel like we're not spending our time doing the things that are of greatest value to the patients and that are of um, greatest fulfillment and joy to us as physicians. So I think those are the things that I foresee happening first. Um, and certainly those other things will come, but but boy, would that make a difference uh, in the lives of, of our of our members, our, our physicians, and our patients would feel it as well. So it's really a win-win situation in the sense of, I mean, these are all causes of burnouts and the onerous tasks, repetitive tasks that uh, clinicians have to do. Um, and you really feel that within some reasonable period of time, a few years, that this this could be implemented? Yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if some some health systems, and, and I know actually of some commercial efforts and research efforts, and um, and the, as long as there is data that exists, a data set that exists, um, people to be able to um, create something that's, that's appropriate and refined and with good uh, labels, uh, an, a, an AI tool can be built for that task. And so really, um, I think the other thing that highlights is who better to know what those tasks or problems that need solving are other than the people who live and breathe it on a day-to-day basis. So that's why I don't think we can leave it up to people in in tech, the engineers. They're going to look at it through their lens, which is not going to be the same lens as which we look at the world. And so when I take care of patients every single day, I know very intimately what it is that would help me do that better. 
what my patients would need to be better supported. And so I'm able to say, this is the problem that we need to solve. What is the way? What is the data that we can gather towards it? How can we work towards that problem? Who can we collaborate towards? And also to be able to frame, this is how it should be implemented. These are the guardrails that we need. Um, This is why if we collect data this way, it's going to be biased. And so we need to collect this additional data where we need to partner with this other group or institution. Those are the very uh, specific kinds of um, impact that we as clinicians can have on this process. And I really think that if we don't, if we don't engage it will be missing. Uh, it will be missing very uh, something very central and very important, and probably won't be able to make the impact that we foresee. Can you give me a, a, just a quick scenario to can help the listener visualize this? I mean, it, a test maybe that you yourself uh, find would like to see go away that you that might be a, a, amenable to this type yeah. of thing. So I, I'll raise the example of, of all of these patients who are in our practices, and I'll just speak about mine specifically. I see a lot of patients with chronic skin disease, um, patients with severe psoriasis, with eczema, with, um, with hair loss disorders, with other things that uh, are needing to be treated on a long-term basis, but also don't follow this very linear, predictable trajectory. And right now what we do is we create... Um, a system of care that is completely centered around the clinician and their convenience. So when I say to my patient, come back and see me in six months, why? Why do I say six months and not five months or three months or eight months? Or um, or why do I say any number of months? Why don't I say, come back to see me when you need to see me or you know, ideally before you know you need to see me, right? So now we're starting to think about how do we shift towards something that's patient-centric that starts to be able to understand um, and predict when a patient is going to need to see me um, and how they're going to need to see me. We haven't even gotten into, do they need to see you in the clinical setting? Could they potentially check in with you through um, a remote or a virtual or a video interaction? Um, there are many ways then that we can employ AI if we say that is a problem worth solving. Um, that is something that we could do better at. Then what we say is, what is the AI technology that we need to help enable that? And then we go down the route of, let's just pick psoriasis, for example. If I have a patient with severe psoriasis, then what I need is some tool or technology that allows me to be able to track or to have some summary of how a patient's doing. Maybe it comes to me in a dashboard. Maybe it tells me, ah, that patient is having an alarm because we know that they're going to have a flare of their disease, or they're off track from their treatment plan and what we expect them to be doing. And so that's when you want to be reaching out and talking to the patient, checking in with the patient, not six months, you know. It's then when it's, it's at the time when, when that patient needs some intervention, when there can be something that you can do to change the course of the disease. That's what patient-focused and patient-centered care looks like. And I think... Um, that's, that example for me shows why it's so essential that we are a critical and core part of that process because who else knows as intimately what it is that, that the best approach and, and, and best setup would be and then to be able to help define what is it that uh, we need technologically to be able to get there. So that's how we integrate technology into the workflow. Um, that's how we utilize our clinical expertise and knowledge. And I think it's through things like that, thinking very rigorously through those things um, that will help us be able to take better care for our patients. And then there's all these issues that relate to it around reimbursement. How am I going to get paid for that care, right? What are the regulations around that? What dictates, you know, whether I'm allowed to do, uh, you know, asynchronous care or uh, or video visits, for example, and some some other specialties. Um, So those types of things then bring up other related issues that we'll also need to grapple and tackle. So this looks, this sounds larger than any individual dermatologist. How do, how do you get involved and how can we play a role in this process. Absolutely. And I think the first and most important thing, and I think the thing that I try to achieve and and do with my talk, is to just get people to think about it and be open to this idea um, and and to dispel some of the myths that people have around artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, and what it means for them in their practice. I think if we're at the stage where people are now open to the potential, seeing the need for us to... um, have a role as, as clinicians and, and as a specialty, the, a, a great first entry point would be the position statement that we published on augmented intelligence that was approved by the board in May. And so that's a, re, that's a, um, 
that, that's a piece that a group of, of leading leading um, experts in our in our field came together. We did the research. We put together what we thought was was a um, was was a stake in the ground about what it what it means for us to have high quality augmented intelligence in our field. Um, and it's a great read. It's got a great diagram. I think it also uh, endeavors to be educational, knowing that not everybody is starting from the same starting point. So even with a basic understanding, basic knowledge, reading that position statement will get um, will, will get uh, get you get you quite far far along. And then beyond that, what we're doing is we're putting together some other educational programs. We're going to have a forum coming up at the annual meeting in 2020 around augmented intelligence. We'll try to put together some. Um, webinars or, or web programs or other learning modules that will also help our um, help our members engage. One last question. Uh, ultimately, how do you think this will move forward? Do you think it will be academic institutions that get involved, researchers who push it, or actually for-profit companies that see a way of, of monetizing this? Yeah. So if I had to guess, <clears throat> I think it's probably a function of um, finding that right coalition of partners. And so part of it, we know that, you know, is there a business model? That question will drive the commercial interest and in, in who might be who might be a part of that. Um, I think, you know, if we look at the um, spectrum of, of technology companies, it's really interesting that some of these big technology companies that have ventured into the world of AI and health haven't necessarily created, you know, big commercial ventures out of it. And they've been at it for a while with some significant resources. So I think that signals to me that maybe what it'll be is um, in, is is a group like the AAD with the weight it has and, and with the breadth and, and reach it has, maybe a, a collaboration, a partnership between a group like that or a consortium of academic institutions, maybe with that right industry partner or industry partners. I'm looking at a use case, again, that, as you mentioned, is the threading the needle, finding the win-win-win all around um, and being able to push forward some of those um, some of those things that will help and improve patient care, but that also have a business case behind it. And I think that's, that's, where, that's where the magic will happen, is being able to have that coalition and that group um, all working towards the patient interest. What are the best options when choosing a topical treatment for pigmentary disorders? In an interview at the Summer American Academy of Dermatology meeting in New York City, Dr. Andrew Alexis talked with MD Edge reporter Ted Bosworth about the right topical regimens. Dr. Alexis is professor and chair of the Department of Dermatology at Mount Sinai St. Luke's and Mount Sinai West in New York. Dr. Alexis, here at the uh, Summer AAD meeting, you provide some very practical information about how to handle hyperpigmentation, starting with topical therapies. And I would like to try and capture that. What is the first line? How do you begin? Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And discuss my uh, presentation at the uh, Summer Academy meeting on topical therapies for treating pigmentary disorders. So when we think about pigmentary disorders, we have two broad types, hyperpigmentation and hypopigmentation. And topical therapies really are the mainstay, the first line of therapy for, for both broad categories. Between the two, hyperpigmentation is really the most common set of disorders, including post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and melasma as being two of the leading disorders. And when approaching the therapy of those common conditions, starting with hydroquinone-based therapy is a typical first line based on the efficacy and safety of doing so. However, from a safety perspective, there's a certain time limit beyond which there are con some risk uh, safety considerations when using hydroquinone. Specifically, with long-term use of hydroquinone, the rare side effect of exogenous ochronosis can occur. And so when looking to the literature as far as guidance on how long one can use hydroquinone safely without the increased risk of exogenous ochronosis, there is data to support that using it less than one year is a safe approach. In fact, most of the data that we do have has uh, supports six months of continuous use. So in my practice, I will use, I'm comfortable using hydroquinone-based therapies for up to six months, after which I will taper or discontinue and transition to a non-hydroquinone-based therapy. As far as non-hydroquinone-based options, we have prescription topicals and non-prescription cosmeceuticals. In the prescription category, we have topical azelaic acid at 15 and 20%. We have the topical retinoids, including tretinoin, 
adapalene, tazeratine, all of which have been shown to be efficacious in treating various types of hyperpigmentation. And, uh, and then in the non-prescription category, we have a growing list of cosmeceutical over-the-counter agents that can play a role in reducing pigment. Most notably, we recently conducted a study with one such topical, which is a multimodal topical cosmeceutical called Litera 2.0. We compared it against the gold standard of 4% hydroquinone in a split phase study. And what we found in these melasma patients that we randomized to having one side of the face treated with the cosmeceutical versus the other side with hydroquinone 4%, is that we saw comparable reductions in melasma severity at the end of the study with both hydroquinone and the non-hydroquinone cosmeceutical Lytera. We also saw comparable improvements in the quality of life impact. So this is one more recent uh, alternative to hydroquinone that's available without a prescription. There's also some emerging data with another topical called uh, cysteamine, 5% cysteamine cream, which works for a variety of mechanisms but doesn't have the same side effects as hydroquinone. And this is something that's been studied in melasma and may, we may see um, increasing use so as we get more experience with it. Moving into the arena of where topical therapies alone don't produce sufficient improvement, which is sometimes a, a common scenario when treating conditions like melasma, where we sort of hit a wall with our topical therapies alone. This is a scenario where I will add uh, in-office procedures, namely chemical peels as a starting point, and in some instances, uh, specific lasers, especially low-energy, non-ablative fractional lasers. When it comes to chemical peels, I'll typically combine topical um, skin lightening therapy with low concentration glycolic acid peels or salicylic acid peels. And these have to be done with caution to minimize excessive irritation, which can induce further pigmentary change in a patient of color. Moving beyond hyperpigmentation, we're faced with patients with a loss of pigmentation, such as post-inflammatory hypopigmentation from seborrheic dermatitis on the face. I presented some data using topical calcineurin inhibitors, such as pimecrolimus, to treat uh, hypopigmentation secondary to seborrheic dermatitis, and also discussed some clinical experience using the topical PDE4 inhibitor, chrysoboral, for facial seborrheic dermatitis with post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. Another common scenario where we see hypopigmentation is in a condition that mimics tinea versicolor, but is called progressive macular hypomelanosis. And similar to tinea versicolor, it involves the trunk, usually the back, the lower back, the abdomen. But to distinguish it from tinea versicolor is it lacks scale and doesn't respond to antifungal therapy. So I discussed the use of a Woods light to help make the diagnosis to rule out vitiligo, but also to rule in progressive macular hypomelanosis by the presence of fluorescence of the bacterium P. acnes, which can fluoresce. You can see it fluoresce within the follicular openings. That can help solidify the diagnosis. Because P. acnes appears to be an important driver of, the, of that condition, therapies, topical therapies directed against P. acnes, such as benzoyl peroxide, benzoyl peroxide clindamycin combinations, with or without phototherapy, have been used, and that's typically what I begin with in my practice. Lastly, I discussed the use of topical bimatoprost for the treatment of vitiligo and other disorders of hypopigmentation. And there, there's uh, limited data using, using it with some efficacy on facial and non-facial vitiligo, and I've had success in my practice of using that as an alternative to topical corticosteroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, or sometimes used in combination to get better response. What you described is sort of a step care approach in, to some degree. And is that true of most patients, or do some patients respond to the first-line agents? Uh, how much is a, of a moving target is hyperpigmentation? Does it require uh, usually have to go back and try different methods? Yes, the hyperpigmentation is one of the more challenging disorders that uh, set of disorders that we treat, and it often does require combination therapy to get the best outcomes. So while we start with topicals, I see my patients back after two to three months of topical therapy alone, at which point we, based on the degree of improvement, can make a decision of whether or not to add 
either a second topical for additional benefit or an in-office procedure such as a glycolic acid chemical peel or salicylic acid chemical peel or in the appropriate patient, a non-ablative fractional laser. And one last question. Can you return to hydroquinone uh, in a patient after, say, a, a year or so without using that approach? Yeah, so uh, when dealing with long-term disorders of hyperpigmentation, such as melasma would be the great, the best example, we often do have to return to hydroquinone after a hiatus. So I'll typically use hydroquinone for up to six months continuously if needed, transition to a non-hydroquinone, but then return to it after a six-month hiatus. So six months on, six months off, roughly, is an approach that uh, I find useful when needed when treating a longer-term disorder like that. But in addition to sort of sequential therapy, hydroquinone-based followed by non-hydroquinone-based combination right from the outset of a hydroquinone-based product plus a non-hydroquinone-based product like a retinoid or azelaic acid actually improves uh, efficacy. So I'll often combine, even from the outset, more than one topical to ensure high efficacy. And would that include one of the uh, cosmeceuticals? Yes, it might include one of the cosmeceuticals. I tend to start with prescription therapy, however, so I may use hydroquinone-based formulation, especially one that is my preferred one based on efficacy and evidence is the triple combination formula that contains 4% hydroquinone, fluocinolone, and tretinoin in a fixed combination. I'll have my patients use that at night. And in the morning, use prescription azelaic acid 15% uh, in a foam vehicle or gel. That's typically what I'll do for the first six months. But after the the six-month mark, I want to transition away from the hydroquinone product, and I may replace that with a cosmeceutical that does not contain hydroquinone. Great. That's very practical information. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Dr. Henry Lim spoke with MD Edge reporter Kari Oaks about some of the recent news about sunscreens. Dr. Lim is a dermatologist at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, and a past president of the AAD. Dr. Lim talked about the potential environmental effects of sunscreen ingredients, as well as results from the FDA's sunscreen absorption study, published in JAMA in May. That phase one study found that maximal application of four sunscreen formulations resulted in plasma concentrations of sunscreen ingredients that exceeded the agency's threshold for waiving toxicology studies for those products. He also discussed whether the use of sunscreen could be contributing to the increase in cases of frontal fibrosing alopecia. Dr. Lim, we're here in New York City at the summer meeting of the American Academy of Dermatology, and you kicked off this morning's uh, sessions with sort of a deep dive into the relationship between uh, certain chemicals found in sunscreens and the potential for environmental degradation, particularly coral reef bleaching. This is a complicated subject, but maybe you could talk to us a little bit about it. Sure. I'd be happy to. Essentially, what is uh, now known is that clearly coral reef bleaching uh, is a phenomenon that had been observed more frequently compared to the past. And the question is that what is the cause? Sunscreen has been associated with it mainly because it has been found that the sunscreen active ingredients are found in water, in seawater in, as well as in coral reef area. The best study on that has just been recently published a few months ago by Dr. Mitchell Moore, and she studied waters around Hawaiian island area, and she measured very carefully the concentration of various active ingredients of sunscreen. What she found indeed is in that there are active ingredients on sunscreen, I call it UV filters, ultraviolet light filters, UV filters that are present in water. However, those concentration was significantly lower than what has been found in the past in laboratory setting that would cause the demise or the killing of the coral reef. So in other words, in the coral reef has been studied in a laboratory setting. If you put UV 
filters in the water in the laboratory setting, the coral reef would be bleached, would be killed. But the concentration that is needed to do that is in the laboratory setting is significantly higher than what has been found in the actual real world setting in Hawaiian water, indicating that sunscreen. And the active ingredient of sunscreen is probably not the only or the major cause of coral reef bleaching. In fact, there are multiple studies that have shown that ocean warming, the warming of the ocean water, is a very significant and a major factor for coral reef bleaching. I think overall they are multifactorial for this uh, major side effect. Sunscreen is just a small component of it, and I think we need to continue to keep our minds open on this very topic. And so more research is needed. People need to keep talking in a dialogue between the disciplines, between dermatologists, those who study the ocean, those who study life in the ocean. Absolutely, I think as dermatologists, what we need to make sure is that we can continue to communicate to our patients that we do know, and the science is very strong on this, on the side effect of excessive sun exposure. We all see in our patients, we all see it on a daily basis in our practice, that uh, excessive sun exposure is associated with multiple side effects, ranging from wrinkling to development of freckles, but more importantly, development of skin cancer. So that part of the science is definitely very, very strong. So I think we need to continue to educate our patients to make sure that they know that need to continue practice photo protection. And photo protection is a topic that I think we need to think about it as a package. That photo protection should include seeking shade when outdoor, applying uh, or administ- uh, applying uh, sunscreen on the exposed area only, but also as importantly, wearing clothing, white brim hat, and sunglasses. That would be the total package. There are a lot of advantages and benefits of being outdoors. I think we need to continue to encourage those who want to be outdoors to participate in activities or to enjoy life in general. They should continue to do that, but they do need to practice for the protection, knowing that sunscreen is just one component, not the only component, but just one component of the photo protection package. And I will say, uh, as the mother of young adult children who raised kids leading an active outdoor life, the range of photoprotective clothing available now is much greater than it was when my children were infants. And there are comfortable, affordable options for Uh, people. Absolutely, yes. Earlier this week, readers of the New York Times might have seen a column called, When You Wear Sunscreen, You're Taking Part in a Safety Study. This cited an FDA randomized trial uh, showing that chemically active components in sunscreen were found in the blood of people who were using sunscreen. Can you talk about if this is something that dermatologists should tell their patients to be concerned about or just stay the course? First of all, I think the title of the article is very misleading. Uh, The purpose of the FDA FDA study uh, is not to do experiments per se. What they are doing is that, and it was a very well done study, uh, what they are doing is that they apply sunscreen under maximal usage condition and measure the absorption of the UV filters into the blood. The maximal usage condition they define it as applying sunscreen to 75% of the body surface using 2 milligram per centimeter square, which is the concentration that is required by the FDA to do sunscreen SPF testing. To translate the 2 milligram per centimeter square, essentially it is one ounce of sunscreen from head to toe. We know that Uh, through multiple studies and from our own experience, I'm certain, uh, that public do not apply sunscreen at that particular concentration. The average concentration that is used usually is between 0.5 to 1 milligram per centimeter square, so one half than the 2 milligram per centimeter square. Furthermore, they ask the subjects to use the sunscreen every two hours, to apply sunscreen every two hours, so four times a day because the study is done for eight, eight hours for a total of four days. Then they measure the amount of 
UV filters that is in the blood, and they show that indeed there are UV filters in the blood. It's not totally surprising because any type of material that we put in or we put on on our skin would get absorbed. That is not surprising. Uh, what FDA also emphasizes, and a lot of time this point is missed uh, uh, by the public, they emphasize in a paper that was published in JAMA that their findings do not, does not indicate that the sunscreen is not safe. So they continue to adv- uh, advocate to continue to use sunscreen as part of the photo protection package. So I think that part, even in the FDA article, it was emphasized as such. And the other part that I think we need to recognize, all the UV filters has been around since the late 1970s. One of them was approved in early 1990s. But so far, aside from allergic reaction that can occur with any type of material that we put on our skin, there have not been any side effects that had been detected that is associated with the UV filters. So in terms of the safety there is no signal for safety thus far. Uh, so what the FDA is doing is that asking the industry to do studies to uh, make sure that the sunscreen is indeed safe. Your colleague, Dr. Stephen Wong, in a related talk this morning, also spoke about the fact that the vehicle seems to make a difference in terms of sunscreen delivery. And what advice can dermatologists give their patients in terms of the safest known vehicle if they have these concerns? Uh, Definitely vehicles have something to do with the absorption. At this moment, there are so many variations out there in terms of the products, in terms of formulations, in terms of vehicles. I think it's going to be very difficult to make a, a a blanket recommendation as to which vehicle to choose. Generally, what I would suggest and I would advise my patients is that whatever they like in terms of uh, applying sunscreen, the important part is to have the sunscreen applied. So be if they like cream, that's fine. If they like spray, that'd be fine. If they like uh, other forms of vehicles, that would be okay. With the spray, just have, one has to be careful not to inhale it. So when you spray it, make sure it is uh, uh, sprayed away from obviously from your face. Uh, Another interesting topic that was introduced this morning by you was the discussion of a potential association between frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is increasing, and the use of sunscreen. But it sounds like the data are mixed there. Yes, uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia is becoming more common, definitely. Those of us who see patients uh, would see, uh, on average, probably a few patients uh, a week uh, with new onset of frontal fibrosing alopecia. The, there have been four surveys, essentially, and these are surveys, so it is a retrospective study uh, that indicate that the use of sunscreen or moisturizer that contains uh, uh, sunscreen active ingredients uh, is associated with the frontal fibrosing alopecia. Several parts that I think we need to recognize that with any type of retrospective study, there are some limitations, uh, recall bias being one. Number two is that the studies were not designed to look at which sunscreen ingredient is causing the frontal fibrosing alopecia. So all we can say is that there is an association of the use of sunscreen with frontal fibrosing alopecia without knowing which active ingredient is involved. But also there is no uh, conclusion that we can draw in terms of causation, causation, meaning that what is the cause, what is the effect. At this moment, there is not enough data on that. The other part that's related to that is the titanium dioxide, which is also used, as uh, all of us know, as a mineral filter in a a sunscreen product. What has been found is that uh, titanium dioxide or titanium uh, element has been detected in the hair shaft of some patient with frontal fibrosing alopecia. The studies are still early. The number of patients are still relatively small that has been examined. Thirdly, is that in some of the control, meaning individuals who did not have frontal fibrosing alopecia in that study, uh, they also contain uh, 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 titanium uh, element in in the hair shaft, indicating at this moment we cannot draw a firm conclusion, again, whether 
titanium particles is causing the frontal fibrosing alopecia, but the data is there. It is something that we should be aware of, that we should be able to uh, educate our patients about. Taking all of this information and some of the new stories in the popular press together as we're nearing the end of the summer here, what can dermatologists tell their patients going forward? I think it's important for us as dermatologists to continue to inform the patient, emphasize to the patient the known side effect of UV exposure, excessive sun exposure. We should educate our patients about the proper way of water protection, which is the package that I have highlighted before, uh, clothing, hats, staying in the shade, and the use of sunscreen on exposed area. And we can tell patients also if they're concerned about the environmental impact of UV filters, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide containing sunscreen are very safe. They have no known environmental impact at this moment uh, that has been reported. Uh, also, they are considered to be uh, so-called class category one by the FDA, meaning that they are not uh, concerned about the safety of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide because there is no data to indicate they have any absorption into the dermis, into the uh, deeper layer of the skin. So they are definitely for those individuals who are concerned, they can use mineral sunscreen. There are limitation with mineral sunscreen. You know, the main one primarily is not very efficient, and because of that, they have to use a higher concentration in achieving the high SPF sunscreen. Because of that, especially for darker skin individual, when they apply those sunscreen, it, the skin may be somewhat whitish looking. That is unacceptable for uh, many of the individuals. And then don't forget also that uh, it, for those who practice good photo protection, they need to take uh, vitamin D uh, on the regular basis to make sure they have adequate vitamin D level. In terms of frontal fibrosing alopecia, I think um, I've just outlined that there are data to show there's association, but clearly there is uh, more studies that needs to be done about that. The data is still very, very early on that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And now an interview with Dr. Samal Desai on treatment approaches for patients with pigmentary disorders. Dr. Desai is on the faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, where he is also in private practice. He is the immediate past president of the Skin of Color Society. Pigmentary disorders are a chronic vexing condition for many dermatologists, and we as board-certified dermatologists are faced with clinical challenges in pigmentation all throughout our practices, no matter if we're solely dedicated to medical dermatology, even aesthetic dermatology, and sometimes even surgical dermatology. So I think the increasing interest in pigmentary disorders, particularly in patients with skin of color, continues to be something that's very relevant and very valid to the daily practicing board-certified dermatologist. The important thing about pigmentation that I think we tried to highlight in our session is that topical therapies remain the mainstay of treatment and are really one of the foundations if you think about building a house, if you're kind of building from base up, topicals still remain part of the gold standard, such as hydroquinone and other skin lightening agents. But oral therapies for hyperpigmentation and even for vitiligo on the other end of the spectrum are increasingly becoming more relevant in the literature as well as in global dermatology practices and also in up-and-coming research, both from investigator-initiated trials and from pharmaceutical companies. So one of the new hot topics is tranexamic acid, which I think you're hearing a lot of buzz about from my fellow pigment gurus and also from other meetings, but oral tranexamic acid therapy has become a very relevant part of our therapeutic armamentarium. It is FDA off-label. It's not approved for melasma and hyperpigmentation, but we're seeing very good results. And I sort of use this as a oral option for my patients who have recalcitrant disease. So a new melasma patient comes in. I'm not discussing oral tranexamic acid from day one. I'm thinking about oral tranexamic acid for that patient who has not responded to triple combination lightning creams containing hydroquinone, who's not responding to photoprotection or antioxidants or cosmeceuticals. For that recalcitrant patient or one who has sort of vexing, relapsing melasma, tranexamic acid I think is a very good option. The important part of this drug is that you do obviously need to realize it's FDA off 
label and make sure you counsel the patient on that, number one. And secondly, screening of the patient, I think, is very important via an extremely detailed medical history and physical exam. And you're really looking to make sure it's the right candidate. So a young, healthy female or male patient, great candidate for tranexamic acid, especially because you want to ensure that the patient has no history of deep venous thrombosis, any hypercoagulability. If they're a smoker, you don't want to do this. Someone who's planning to get pregnant or is nursing or on oral contraceptives. Those are patients who would not be good candidates for this. But a young, healthy male or female with melasma who's not on a lot of medications, no other significant past medical history, you've taken a good history, you've documented it, you've done a good exam. Starting this drug between 250 milligrams and 500 milligrams twice a day is a good option. And that's really what has been published in global literature. Here in the U.S., however, there's only one formulation, which is 650 milligrams, and so I advise my patients to split it in half and take 325 milligrams in the morning and 325 milligrams at night, and you typically see results fairly quickly. The the drug has a fairly short half-life, so the BID dosing or twice daily is important, and I usually keep patients on this for several weeks to continue to see improvement. And once they do start to improve, then we continue to talk about the fact that lifelong photoprotection and antioxidants and cosmeceuticals still are an important part of the therapeutic regimen. In terms of other oral therapies, I've mentioned antioxidants, but specifically polypodium leucotomus is very important uh, in my practice. We use a lot of that. That helps to increase the patient's body UV protective factor. does not replace sunscreen, so I tell patients it's not as simple as just popping a vitamin and thinking that you're good to go when you go out in the sun or go to the beach. You still need to wear photoprotection, but it helps to increase the body's UV protective factor, which is important in hyperpigmentation. And also, uh, it's important to mention that it's an antioxidant. It's actually a dietary supplement you can buy it over the counter. And because of that antioxidant effect and helping with the body's UV protection, and some nice benefits in melasma. So that's another oral option for, for melasma specifically. Yeah. And, and I really do recommend polypodium leucotomus a lot of times for patients who have hyperpigmentation. On the flip side of this is I also recommend polypodium leucotomus for my vitiligo patients because it is an antioxidant. So you're helping to reduce that oxidative stress, potentially scavenge some free radicals and helping those patients. In fact, there's studies that show if you have someone with vitiligo and phototherapy, and you give them polypodium leucotomus two or three times a day, they have higher rates of repigmentation in narrowband UVB versus the patients who are just in the light box without the polypodium alone. So I actually like polypodium for all of my pigment patients, if you will. And it's important to know that there's more studies being done on that. So we hopefully get more data. And polypodium leucotomus is a dietary supplement, and I do combine that with tranexamic acid in my patients if they're on that orally or if they're just on topical therapies for melasma. And then in vitiligo specifically, there's lots of interest now in the new JAK inhibitor drugs. That's where we're all talking about those, and I lecture a lot about those, and and I'm doing clinical trials. They're exciting. Janus kinase inhibitors, in, in my opinion, are part of the new frontier in immunotherapy or immunology and dermatology, and by inhibiting that JAK stat pathway on a molecular level, we know we can decrease inflammation and help to reduce the number of CD8-mediated T cells ultimately that are attacking the melanocytes and vitiligo and killing off the patient's pigment-producing cells. And so oral JAK inhibitors, things like tofacitinib, which are already FDA-approved for rheumatoid arthritis, not approved for vitiligo, but I have used it in patients who have really chronic, relapsing, unstable vitiligo or who have not responded to other traditional therapies, and we've, we're seeing good results. I will tell you, though, that oral JAK inhibitors right now are extremely expensive since they aren't FDA approved, so it's really important to have the discussion with the patient that they may be paying a couple thousand dollars a month in cash for these drugs. I've had a few very motivated patients who have done that, who can afford to do that. But there's also more studies being done by some of our pharmaceutical companies and investigators on newer JAK inhibitors that have been somewhat published in the literature. Uh, Baricitinib, upadacitinib, some of the other TINIB drugs, I call them the IB drugs, a lot of those are being studied right now. So I think there's a lot more to come for vitiligo and alopecia areata and atopic dermatitis and all of those T-cell mediated conditions. There are topical JAK inhibitors that are also helpful and topical JAK inhibitors really do 
help my patients who can't do the oral but still want to do something with a newer technology. So ruxolitinib topically, 1.5% to 2%. Tofacitinib topically, 2%. Again, cream, usually twice daily. Works really well. Works better when you combine it with light. So the theme here you're probably hearing me say is that none of this is monotherapy. This is all combination treatment for pigmentary disorders. But it's an exciting time for us in, in this part of dermatology, and there's a lot on the horizon. And that concludes this week's episode of Dermatology Weekly. To get past and future episodes of Dermatology Weekly, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Terry Rudd. For Dr. DeLeo, MD Edge editor, Melissa Sears, and all of us here at MD Edge, I'm Elizabeth Mishkati. Thanks for listening.